You know, Lord, we are so grateful for the opportunity to worship you today, to come before you as your body, that uh, we have the opportunity to be your servants, to um, worship together, to praise together, to fellowship together, to uh, share each other's burdens together, to care for each other together. And I just pray that you would encourage us as we worship you and continue to seek your face in the message today. And we just pray that you would speak uh, to each one of our hearts and that you would show us uh, more about you so that we can live in a way that pleases you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Um, I want you to think. Now, this, you may not be able to think of anything. Okay, but I want you to think and think of a person uh, that if they would only change, you could be more godly. <laughs> <laughs> only one? <laughs> Can you think of anybody? If, if, if there was somebody, if, if, if they could only change, then, then you could be more godly. Well, we're going to look at today, living God's dream, avoiding the barrier of others. Of others, okay? And Craig has, I want Craig to illustrate uh, for us what the difference between an obstacle and a barrier is. Mary, could you click off the, uh, just the stage lights? Stage lights. There you go. Uh, can you tell me, does anybody know what that is? It's a vault. That is the door at NORAD. Blast door. NORAD, the uh, North American R Radar uh, Operational Defense, or some North American something. Um, it's where they control the nuclear missiles that are pointed everywhere around the world. So what happens if there is a uh, DEFCON 1 situation, then that door shuts. And I don't know if you can see it, but there are, that door, there's a guy right there. There's a guy. And so that door is about five feet thick. And then when that door closes, you see these little holes here? There are little bars right here that push into that door. And that door becomes a barrier. You cannot get around that door. Once that door is locked, the only way to open it is from the inside. You can't open it from the outside. All right, what's the other thing we have there? Okay. All right, you see this? What is this? It's an obstacle. An obstacle course. And why do they call it an obstacle course? Because you're supposed to get around it, get over it, get through it. You know, and, and uh, I see these, these kids climbing over this obstacle here. An obstacle is something that we can get around or get over or get through. A barrier is something you can't ever hope to move. Okay? Can you turn the lights back on here? Thank you. Okay. So you and I are faced with uh, obstacles and barriers. And we talked about the obstacles of sin, fear, anger, and distractions, right? And those are the things you can do something about personally. And then we're, now we're talking about the barriers. These are things we can't change. Cannot change. And what we learned last week is that you cannot change God. We cannot change God. So if you're angry with God, if you, if you think of God, that if God would only do something differently in a different way or in a different time, then you could have your dream life, then you're mistaken because your dream life is consistent with God's ways. That God's dream for your life is consistent with his ways. So uh, it doesn't work. Well, this, this second barrier is people. Other people. Anybody know any other people? Just a few. <laughs> Anybody live with some other people? <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a guy uh, who lived with other, other people, and uh, he had a problem. And it's uh, if you want to turn to 1 Samuel 15, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, the guy's name is Saul. Saul was the king of Israel. Right? He had been appointed by Samuel the prophet. 
to be the first king of Israel, and uh, he's made some mistakes up to this point, but we see in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1, that uh, Samuel comes to Saul with a message from God, and it says, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came out from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them. All right. Now this next sentence, I was, I was seriously considering not preaching this sermon because of this next sentence. But I, I chose to do it because I thought we needed to talk about it. It says, But kill both man and and woman, infant, and nursing child, ox, and sheep, camel, and donkey. Does that bother anybody? Mm -hmm. I think it bothers all of us. The idea of, of if, if I were in Israel at that time, and God had given the command to do that, I would have a hard time. Okay, I'm, I'm not a violent person. Well... <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I am in my sleep. <laughs> I am a violent person, but uh, I, I, you know, the, there's the warring, there's the, the, the gentleness side of me and the uh, intensely rageful side of me that, that coexist and uh, that, you know, I have to live with. So <clears throat> I don't think I could do it, you know. Uh, I don't think I could kill children like that. I just don't think I could. Why would God say something like this? Why would God say something like this? Now, we know that according to, from what we saw last week in, in the sermon, that God's ways are what? Does anybody remember what God's Higher. ways are? Higher. Higher than our ways, right? And our ways are lower. God's ways are righteousness and grace, right? Righteousness and gracious, truth and justice. Okay. So where in that four part description of God's way, would this fit in with him? Justice. Now why? Well, I want you to, uh, first of all, this, this story about Amalek comes uh, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 17. Now the children of Israel had just crossed the Jordan River, or pardon me, the Jordan River. Uh, that's later on. The, the Red Sea. They'd crossed over the Red Sea. They had the big dance. For those of you who believe, you know, those, those people out in the world, Christians who believe dancing is wrong, it was sinful for them to dance after... Oh, I'm just kidding. That was a joke. It's not funny. Uh, so then they come to the waters of uh, Mara, where the waters are bitter, and they God purifies the water, right? And then right after that, they're heading toward Mount Sinai. So this is... This is within the first few weeks of, of them leaving Egypt, right? And, and all of a sudden, uh, out of nowhere, <coughs> the Amalekites attack the Jews, the nation of Israel. They're just traveling. They're, just, they're out in the desert. They're in the middle of nowhere. And, and out of nowhere, the Amalekites attack them. And it says in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 to 19, exactly what they did. It says, Remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks, all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary, and he did not fear God. Now, who is at the back of the, the marching? Who are the ones that... Who? The slow and the weak. The slow and the weak. Which includes who? Children and children. Women and children and elderly people, right? So as the, the nation of Israel is marching towards Sinai, the Amalekites come and attack them from behind and slaughter their women, children, and elderly. And we don't know how many were killed, but it had to be in the thousands because there were millions of Jews leaving <coughs> Egypt. So... The Amalekites, without any provocation, without any warning, slaughtered the, the women, children, and elderly and the sick of the nation of Israel. And this is God's response to that in Exodus 17, 14. I'm flipping back and forth here. Right? 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And then uh, skipping down to Deuteronomy 25, uh, verse 19, it says, Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God has given you rest from your enemies all around in the land which your lo the Lord your God has given you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of an Amalek from under heaven you shall not forget. So, <coughs> do we, do our hearts kind of understand why God would do this? Uh, kind of. Uh, God's ways are higher than our ways, and he, he has the right to execute justice. Uh, doesn't mean we have to like it, right? We, we don't have to understand it or like it, but we, we, we understand that his ways are higher, higher than our ways, and that he was justified uh, in what he did, because God's way is justice, okay? Any questions on that? You can talk to me later about it. This is one of those difficult passages in the Bible. There are a lot of these. We just kind of skim over them, though, and we don't want to talk about it because they make us uncomfortable. Fortunately, we live in the age of grace, and we don't have... God isn't calling us to do this kind of thing. Amen. Praise the Lord <laughs> that we're living in the age of grace. So, all right, so let's keep going. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, and uh, there were 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And he came to the city of Amalek, and when he went there, he found out that there were, uh, uh, what are they, Kenites. Now, Kenites were Midianites, specifically of the family of Moses' father-in-law, Jephro. So the Kenites were descended from Moses' father-in-law. Right? So they were living uh, with the Amalekites, and when Saul came, he said, hey, you guys were a big help to us, so... You better leave because we're about to destroy them. So the Kenites left, and in verse 7, Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them, but everything despised and worthless that they had to really destroy. So I have some observations about this. This is the setting of the story. Some observations. First of all, sometimes when we read the Bible, we find things God does that we can scarcely understand in this age of grace. But God always acts in a way that is consistent with his ways. Right? We can, we can believe that, have faith in that. That God hasn't gone off and become this evil, vengeful, hateful God. But this is a part of him and his ways, which is justice and righteousness. And then the second thing I want us to see, you know, when Saul, they saw all these wonderful animals, and they saw the opportunity to humiliate Agag, king of the Amalekites. And, and this was a big popular thing back then. When you caught the, uh, the, the king of the, the opposing nation, you put him in chains, and you, you made him a slave in your court. And, you know, they even did things like cut off their thumbs and stuff. It was really weird. But that was how they humiliated and showed their dominance. And it was kind of a trophy. And so Saul, what were they told to do? Kill everyone and everything, right? What did they do? They killed everyone and everything except what they didn't want to kill. <laughs> what they wanted to keep. And so sometimes we mistake our ways for God's ways. Right? We... God gives us a command, and we, you know, and I see this so much in our in Christianity today, in our world today, where we as Christians hear these things, we hear these commands that God gives us, and, for example, a, a very popular uh, uh, concern in the church today is, is the issue of fornication, having um, relations with people you're not married to, all right? That's what the Bible calls fornication. And so you'll hear on a Sunday morning that you shouldn't do it. And then Christians will go off and, and they'll be involved in fornication and, and think they're following God's ways. We do that as Christians. And I'm, not, I'm just, that's an example, but that's, that's, we do. Sometimes we confuse our ways with God's ways. We think we're doing the right thing when in actuality we're not. 
that make sense to anybody? Is that true of you right now? Is that true of me right now? That there are things I think I'm doing the right way that I'm, I'm assuming are God's ways that are not His ways? Yes, 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 that's true. Unfortunately, it's true. All right. So the point, I, I made this mistake last week. Number one, God told Saul to execute judgment on the Amalekites. I know you were all waiting for that, weren't you? All right, number two, God tells Samuel about Saul's disobedience. So uh, God, Samuel told uh, Saul to do this, and obviously it's taken some time because he, he destroyed the whole nation of Amalek. And uh, so however long that took, 1 Samuel 15 verse 10 skips all of that, and we, we come there in verse 10, and it says, oops, sorry, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Was God confused about what he had told Saul to do? No, not at all. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel, really, he liked Saul. He loved, he loved him as a son, I think. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. <laughs> you ever have a conversation with somebody where you knew it was not going to end well? Yeah. <laughs> and they were totally clueless about the situation. But, in verse 14, Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? That's probably one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. But, uh, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And so Saul said to him, Speak up. Do you think Saul knew what he was doing? I, I don't think he knew what he was... You think he knew what... I don't know. I don't... You know, he he comes to, to Samuel, and I, I don't know that Saul would lie outright to Samuel, you know, to his face like that. And maybe he could, but... I kind of feel like he's, he thinks he's done the right thing. But even as he tells Samuel the story about what was done, even unconsciously he's maneuvering things, right? He's maneuvering the story to make it so that he's not responsible for what's going on. Right? They kept the sheep out. The people kept the best of the flocks because they wanted a sacrifice. But we killed everything that we were supposed to kill. You see what I'm saying? So the observation there is that sometimes we unconsciously place the responsibility of our actions onto others. I don't I don't I don't know that a lot of times we do that consciously. I think we do it unconsciously, subconsciously, where we're positioning ourselves like pieces on a chessboard to get ourselves into a position where we can, you know, not get into trouble for doing things wrong. Yeah. This is really tricky stuff because we don't know we're doing it. Number three. Samuel tries to pin down a slippery saw. Slippery saw. For Samuel 15, verses 17 through 21. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you sneak down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Do you think he's pretty clear in the facts here that God told him to destroy everything that he didn't and that was disobedience was, was that pretty clear I mean was Samuel beating around the bush no he was being perfectly clear 
And so Saul answers in verse 20, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission in which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek, and I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen. The best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Okay, there's a reason we didn't do what we were. We, 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 we did it, but we didn't do it, but we did, didn't do it. And it's because we didn't did do it. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And, and he just couldn't pin him down. He just he kept slip, slipping and slipping away from the confrontation. Have you ever had any kind of a confrontation like that where... Have you ever responded that way to a confrontation? I have. I have, I'm sure. Um, and the observation I would make there is that uh, Saul had a, an opportunity here to be made right with God, to, to come clean and say, you're absolutely right, I sinned, please forgive me. But what did he do? He denied responsibility and redirected the blame onto everybody else. We know people like that, don't we? Mm -hmm. But denial and redirecting blame onto others does a terrible thing. It stops the re repentance process. When I deny my responsibility and redirect the blame onto someone else for what I'm doing, then I stop the repentance process. You cannot repent as long as you're doing this. You think that's a bad thing? That's yeah. A, that's a very bad thing. Let's keep going. And uh, number four, Samuel lays it on the line for Saul, for Samuel 22 and 23. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. I don't think he saw that coming. So, what were the two things that, that uh, Saul did? That he committed two sins here. What were the two sins? The first sin is... Uh, rebellion. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Is as the sin of witchcraft. What was his act of rebellion? He didn't kill every everyone and everything like God had said. So that that's an act of rebellion. When we choose not to do what God commands, then we are committing rebellion, which is as evil as witchcraft, according to God. And then, what was the second sin? The second sin was stubbornness. Is, as iniquity and idolatry. What was the stubbornness that he was guilty of? He wouldn't accept responsibility. He was defending himself. His stubbornness was that he, in order to defend his, his own innocence, <coughs> or he wasn't innocent, defend himself, he redirected blame and externalized responsibility. He... he deflected all of that. And so when we refuse to repent, what is that? It's stubbornness. When God comes right out and confronts us, some using some other person's mouth, has, has God ever done that to you? Confronted you with some other person, person's mouth? <laughs> that's a, a lot of the times that's how he does it. He confronts us using some other person's mouth. We have a choice, and as his children, what are what are we? What do you think we should do? Obviously, accept responsibility for what we've done, and repent. So the observation there on number four: when we refuse to admit our failures, we make a bad situation worse. That's what happens when we refuse to repent for the things that we've done, and you know. I'm thinking in my head of things that I need to repent of. You, do, you, do you have anything that you need to repent of that God has made you aware of and you haven't done anything about it yet? Anybody? Something? Okay. 
as, as long as we continue in that direction, as long as we continue to hold on to that thing and minimize the responsibility that we have for what we've done, uh, then we run the risk of making a bad situation worse. What was the, what was the punishment for witchcraft? Death. Death. What was the punishment for idolatry? Death. Death. So, uh, one punishment is bad enough, but two punishments, I mean, what are they going to do? Uh, put you to death and then chop you up into little pieces and feed you to the dogs or something? I don't know. But we need to be careful when we're confronted with the sin that we are committing, because we are all committing sin, that we don't deflect that away from ourselves. We need to embrace it, because it's only through embracing our sin in a godly way that we can come to the place of repentance where we can put off that sin by acknowledging that it's wrong and that we shouldn't do it anymore. Okay. Point number five. <coughs> the resolution. You know, um, I'll give you a little sermon lesson here. When, you, when I'm preaching a narrative, this is a narrative, uh, a story has different parts to it. There's the, the setting. And the setting of this story is the, the part where uh, we hear the command of Samuel to go and kill all the Amalekites and what Saul does. And then, and then the next part, which is the conflict, is where uh, God tells Samuel to go confront Saul. And then the crisis is when Saul slips around and, and turns into Teflon man and can't get pinned down by Samuel. And then uh, the climax is when Samuel tells Saul that God has rejected him. Well, now we're at the resolution. How it resolves the story here. Number five, Saul misses his opportunity to live God's dream for his life. You know, is God patient? Is God gracious? If we confess our, our sins, will he forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from those sins? Will he use us for his glory regardless of what we did yesterday if we, if we repent and serve him today? Was that opportunity there for Saul? It was. Even now, even after God had said, I reject you, he could have repented and God could have still used Saul in his life. But this is what happens in 1 Samuel 12, or 15, verses 24 through 35. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to kind of go over it. Uh, so Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned. Now that sounds great, right? I have sinned. Does that sound like he's taking responsibility for his actions? He should have shut his mouth at that point, but he didn't. He kept talking. He said, For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Who's responsible here? They are. I was afraid of them. They made me afraid. I'm taller than all of them. I'm their king. I'm the guy in charge. But man, I'm really afraid of them. And they made me do it. Is that repentance? Not at all. So Samuel said, uh, in verse 25, we, we hear the, the real motivation for this repentance. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He had to have Samuel. Samuel was kind of a figurehead. He was a, uh, a, a, a VIP in the nation of Israel. And, and as long as Saul had Samuel standing next to him, Saul had the, the uh, credibility that he needed to, to be the king of Israel. Right? But Samuel says to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king of Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe, and it tore. So Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to, your, to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. Talking about God. For he is not a man that he should relent. Then he said, I have sinned. This is again Saul saying, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Again, what was his motivation for repentance? To get out of Samuel what he needed from him, which was validation. So Samuel did. He went back and he worshiped with Saul there. And, and then uh, Saul, oh, this is a brutal part of the story, so... 
Agag is standing around watching all this, right? He's this little confrontation thing. And, and so Samuel uh, says, okay, bring Agag. And Agag thinks, well, it's okay. Everybody's calmed down now. The battle's over. I'm going to be okay. Well, what did God command Saul to do? Kill everyone, including Agag. So uh, Saul lost his trophy, and uh, Agag was killed there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you're in the gruesome stuff, but it says in verse 33 that Samuel hacked Agag in pieces. Yuck. How many of you watch movies like that? <laughs> I saw one guy who was on and honest enough to raise his hand that he watches movies like that. How many of you guys watch movies like that? <laughs> At least I so Samuel went to Ramah, and uh, Saul went to his house, and Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Now, this, that's interesting, I'll just look at that there. Samuel died before Saul, but then Saul went to the witch at Endor, and the witch at Endor called Samuel up for the grave, and so uh, Samuel told Saul on the day of his death that he was going to die. And God had brought him back to give Saul that message. So, observation, the last observation here is that blaming other people for our problems will keep us from living God's dream for our lives. You know when I asked you, if there was somebody that you thought of, that if they would only become more godly, you could become more godly. That is a barrier. They're a barrier to you. You can't change them, can you? Can you change anyone? Have you tried? Let me see those hands. We've all tried to change people. You can't change people. You could pray for them, that God would change them, but that doesn't guarantee anything. So if we choose to blame other people for our actions, and I'm not even saying that you've done something wrong and you're pointing at somebody else's fingers, but you're sinning in, in some way, and you're saying, well, I'm sinning this way because that person is sinning their way, and they're making me sin this way, then you are not going to be able to live God's dream we cannot live God's dream until, what, we take responsibility. Does God know that that person is doing that thing? Yeah. Does God's dream for your life depend on that other person being able to live the way that they should? No, it doesn't. We are the ones who are responsible for our actions and our choices. We cannot redirect the blame and responsibility on others. We have to accept it for ourselves. So, uh, application, all right? We should never underestimate God's determination to execute his ways of righteousness and grace and truth and justice in our lives. You make a mistake if you do. We should always keep the awareness of the human tendency to blame others in the back of our mind. And by, by that I mean that we all have that tendency at times to, to do that. So we should, if someone comes to us and says you're responsible and you say you're not, you need to really make sure you're not. You need to ask for advice, uh, third third party advice. Am I not? Because we do do that as human beings, and then when we deny our sin or redirect blame unto others, we are not truly repentant. And then when we deny our sin or redirect blame unto others, we usually make a bad situation worse. And then finally, the application is denying our sin and blaming others for our problems will keep us from living God's dream for our lives. And we want to live God's dream. How many of you want to live God's Amen. dream for your life? Okay, so if, if there's anybody who comes to mind when I say, if that person would only, then I could take serious stock in that because they're not the ones keeping you from living God's dream. You are. And you can, you can address the obstacles. What are the obstacles? Your own sin, your fear, your anger, and your distractions. By focusing on those instead of changing God or changing people, you're going to be able to move forward in your Christian walk. Live God's dream for your life. <coughs> That's what we want, right? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you. You are the God of righteousness and grace, the truth and justice, Lord. And your ways are higher than our ways. Lord, we as human beings from Adam 
all the way till now have been redirecting blame. As Adam, when you confronted him and said, what did you do in the garden when he ate the fruit? He said, your wife you gave this to me. My wife that you gave me gave this to me. And ever since then, we've been redirecting blame and, uh, and uh, denying our responsibility. So I pray that you would help us as your children not to fall into this trap, not to be bound up by the barrier of other people, mm -hmm. but that we would just walk around it, just turn from it and, and determine that we're not going to waste our time on this other person's behavior or allow it to keep us from living the way you've got, you want us to live. Lord, I pray that you would guide and direct us, that you would give us the strength to follow you with all of our heart and to live the dream we have for our lives. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.